Hi everyone, this is the second lecture, part 2. In part 1, I've already discussed with you the consequences of excessive greenhouse gas emissions on our environment. And we have looked at how it caused the melting of our polar ice caps, rising sea levels, the melting of permafrost, stress on fresh water supplies, increasing the intensity and um, duration of heat waves and heavy rains. So for part two, we're going to look at the impact of excessive greenhouse emissions on living organisms such as coral reefs and migration patterns of fishes and insects. So let's talk about coral reefs. Coral reefs are corals are animals. All right, they are marine invertebrates. They secrete calcium carbonate to form a hard skeleton. They are very colorful because they have a symbiotic relationship with a pigmented um, organism called zooxanthellae. Zooxanthellae live inside the coral polyps, okay, and they have the ability to photosynthesize. So corals develop this symbiotic relationship with zooxanthellae because corals provide zooxanthellae with protected environments and zooxanthellae provide corals with organic compounds that they produce uh, through photosynthesis. Coral breaching is the event uh, where uh, corals become white due to stress-induced expulsion or death of their symbi symbiotic protozoa zooxanthellae. Okay, and the corresponding loss of pigmentation within the protozoa. So this picture shows you a colorful coral reef and certain, certain stresses that co the corals um, experience, including that due to global warming, can cause coral, coral bleaching. And what we see is a whitening effect of these corals because they have expelled their symbiotic protozoa, the, the colorful zooxanthellae. Let's watch this video that will cover more about coral bleaching and its effects. We've now had three major bleaching events on the Great Barrier Reef. In 98, 2002, and again just recently in 2016, we zigzagged along the whole length in a helicopter and fixed wing plane. We put about 100 people underwater. The extent and severity of this bleaching is off the chart. Typically, a bleached coral is nutritionally compromised. But this time around, we discovered an additional phenomenon. Many of the corals we surveyed were already dead. They actually cooked. And that's because the temperatures this time around were so extreme. Already in 2016, severe coral bleaching has also been recorded across the Pacific Ocean, in Fiji, across the Indian Ocean, in the Maldives and the Seychelles, and even in the Southern Red Sea. Similar events are predicted across the Caribbean and Micronesia, in a year in which the impacts of heat stress on the global ocean have reached unprecedented extremes. As the distribution of marine species continues to change, as storm surges continue to intensify, as sea ice and glacier melt accelerate, and as sea level rise and human displacement intensifies. Countries around the world in Paris last year have committed to a rapid transition away from fossil fuels towards more sustainable renewable energy. Paris marked the moment when the world finally decided to heed the ever-rising mountain of evidence that had been piling up for years and began instead to galvanize our focus. Is 
s'il y avait une seule chose à réussir pour appliquer l'accord de Paris, c'est la réduction des émissions de, de gaz à effet de serre. Pour augmenter la résilience de l'océan, il faudrait bien sûr lutter contre le réchauffement climatique, euh, donc monter en puissance sur les énergies renouvelables, y compris les énergies renouvelables marines. Okay, right, so as we saw from the video, stress can result in coral bleaching as the zoos and telly are expelled from the coral's tissues. Okay, and a common cause of this stress is increase in um, sea temperatures. Okay, once bleaching begins, it tends to continue even without continuing stress. And Prolonged periods of bleaching or intense warming, as we saw in the video just now, may eventually lead to the coral's death. Now, if the coral colony survives this stressful period, zooxanthellae may return, but they may require weeks or months to return to normal density. After that, new residents of the reef, um, a new, re new species may come back to live in the reef, Okay, but they may be of different species. So this changes the makeup of the marine ecosystems dramatically. So once this biological diversity is reduced, uh, as, uh, as is often the case, once a stressful period is over, biological diversity is often reduced. And once this happens, this makes the reef even less resilient to future environmental changes. Now let's take a look at the factors that will lead to coral bleaching. The first two common ones are temperature change and ocean acidification. Now these two are brought upon by excessive emission of greenhouse gases. Climate change can also kill corals by changing their life cycles and reproductive processes. Okay, rising sea levels will also cut out light that the corals uh, like. Okay, and extreme weather events can also physically damage corals. Let's look at temperature change, which is the most common cause of coral bleaching. Now, over the years, the average global surf sea surface temperatures has steadily increased. And the reason for this is because at over 90% of the heat trapped in greenhouse gases in our atmosphere is absorbed by our oceans. Okay, but because water has high capacity for heat, okay, the, the increase in uh, global surface sea temperature is still not as high as that of atmospheric temperatures. Okay, nonetheless, nonetheless, corals, they thrive in shallow tropical waters and they are very sensitive to temperature changes. That's why most corals Right, like the branching corals such as the table coral, they are more susceptible to this stress following such temperature changes. Okay, only certain larger coral colonies such as porites are able to withstand these extreme temperature shocks. Overall, corals are temperature sensitive, okay, and uh, most of them will succumb to the increased um, temperature rise of the sea. Okay, now let's talk about the effects of ocean acidification. As much as one third of atmospheric carbon dioxide is absorbed by the oceans. So as you know, the carbon dioxide will react with seawater to form carbonic acid and this results in ocean acidification. As the coral skeletons are made up of calcium carbonate, their skeletons will be dissolved. This reduces the ability for corals to build or create their skeletons and it will also compromise their fertilization process. Next, corals generally grow best at depths shallower than 70 meters. Now because global warming causes sea levels to rise, corals will find themselves in deeper waters. So as sea levels continue to rise, most corals cannot survive. 
because they will receive insufficient sunlight. And their symbiotic protozoa, the zooxanthellae, requires the sunlight to photosynthesize and provide nutrients both for themselves and also for the corals. Okay, and for this reason, corals um, rely on some sufficient source of sunlight to survive. Okay, and as the corals find themselves in deeper waters because of the sea level rise, they will also find themselves in colder temperatures. And as I mentioned before, corals are very temperature sensitive. They thrive in tropical, shallow, warm waters, right? So they do not like the temperatures be too high. They also do not like it when the temperatures are too low. Finally, um, you know that global warming will uh, increase the incidence of extreme weather events. And so tropical storms and heavier rainfalls may increase and this may cause more physical damage to the coral reefs. Okay? And so this will also lead other coastal ecosystems and co uh, coastal communities to be affected as well. For example, Hurricanes Hugo and Marilyn, which hit the U.S. Virgin Islands National, pa National Park in 1989 and in 1995, respectively, did massive damage to the coral ecosystems. Now, just a side note, ocean acidification does not only affect corals, okay, but they also harm shellfish because shellfish also have cell shells made up of calcium. So ocean acidification will also uh, thre threaten the structures of these sensitive ecosystems or upon which some fish and shellfish rely. Now let's talk about the migration of fishes and insects. Now animals like fishes and insects, they all use environmental cues for the timing and navigation of their migration. Okay, and because global warming and climate change causes this change in all their environmental cues, it will affect their phenology and the extent of their migration. Now, what is phenology? Phenology is actually the study of periodic plant and animal life cycle events. So whenever we say that an animal or plant's phenology is affected, we are uh, referring to their life cycle events. Okay, their life cycle events, their phenology is affected by climate change. Furthermore, fishes and insects are ectotherms. They are cold-blooded. So their physiology is tied very closely to environmental temperatures. And so their migration uh, patterns is very tight, uh, tied very closely to changes in environmental temperatures as well. Okay, let's watch this video to find out more about how fish migration patterns have been uh, affected due to climate change and the um, following consequences. Almost half of the world's population is reliant upon fish as a food source or as a way of making a living. But rising temperatures are changing the oceans and disrupting fish habitats. And carbon taken in from the atmosphere is making the oceans more acidic, affecting the growth and survival of many species. Many fish are being forced to adapt, migrate or die. The impact upon people who rely on fish for their sustenance and livelihoods will be profound. The ocean covers almost three quarters of the Earth's surface and acts as a huge temperature store. In spite of this, average sea level temperatures have risen three times slower than the air temperature on land. But even slight changes in temperature in certain regions can produce huge shifts in the distribution of life under the water. Many marine animals are capable of short-term adaptation by changing their behaviour or physiology. Fin and humpback whales, which can be found from the poles to the equator, 
have altered their migration patterns over time as a result of warmer waters. But fish that have evolved in less variable polar or tropical temperatures are less able to adapt and are sensitive to even slight changes. And those in equatorial regions are already living close to their upper heat limit. If the ocean surface temperature rises between 2 to 3 degrees Celsius, by early next century, equatorial waters could become completely uninhabitable for most shallow water fish currently living there. Those that cannot leave will face local extinction. Whether evolution can keep up with climate change in the long run is unknown. But a mass undersea migration has already been happening for decades. Around the world, both cold water and warm water fish have been heading towards the poles, searching for cooler waters. North Sea cod have moved farther north and gone into deeper territory over the past century as a result of climate change. This has been good news for Greenland's fishermen, but not for those further south. Red mullet used to be a staple Mediterranean catch, but from the mid-1990s started to be seen off the coast of Scotland for the first time in 70 years. Plankton, primary food sources to all sorts of animals, have moved the most out of all marine life. In 2010, researchers sailing off Norway's Svalbard archipelago found tropical plankton from the equator in their nets, a possible preview of climate-induced changes. Where prey moves, predators usually follow, so entire food webs will likely be affected. But not all the changes will be harmful. On current temperature trends, the world will actually start to experience a net increase in biodiversity, as species expand and thrive in new spaces. But by mid-21st century, there will be large losses and local extinctions across tropical regions, resulting in an overall net loss. And while migration can spell survival for the fish able to make the transition, it can also adversely affect the ecosystems of the places they migrate to. Recent expansions have already been causing havoc. Invading tropical fish have been decimating kelp forests of southern Japan, which provide nutrients to local species. Melting ice between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans is opening up large-scale pathways for species invasions of the size not seen for three million years. What effects mass migrations will have upon complex ecosystems in the long term is unknown. But as the tropics experience large-scale losses of species that are not replaced, many will lose the fish they depend on to survive. Okay, right. So as mentioned in the video, right, as temperatures rise, fish that normally thrive in the tropics, who, who are already at their upper heat limit, are quickly migrating towards the cooler seas. Okay, they're swimming closer to the polar regions because they're in search of better oxygenated water and a much fuller source of food. Okay, as I mentioned in the previous part of the lecture, um, increasing uh, water temperatures will make it more difficult for oxygen to uh, remain dissolved in the water so uh, warmer waters are usually less well oxygenated okay so that's why fish like to find cooler waters with more uh, with better oxygenated uh, levels okay so you can see from this graph here graph here that many species have migrated either southwards or northwards okay and a more are migrating towards the North Pole. So the average shift is towards the North Pole. Now, uh, there are further impacts to the increase of sea temperatures. So because of the changing migration patterns, this changes diversity of species within a certain region. And there will be competition with other species in the new areas that fish migrate to and this will upset ecosystems. For non-migrating fish, uh, fish species, um, they will have problems um, uh, they will have problems maintaining their population size okay and this will mean sustainability issues for us when it comes to uh, 
acquiring food for ourselves. Okay, and um, increasing sea temperatures are also driving many commercially important fishes into the wider seas. So again, this causes us some food insecurity issues. All right. Furthermore, uh, the increasing sea temperatures are causing changes to the timing of reproduction in these fish species okay, and their susceptibility to disease. Okay, so for instance, warmer temperatures have affected the life cycle of the salmon and increased their likelihood uh, to fall to disease. So combined with other climate in impacts, these effects are projected to lead to large decli declines of salmon populations. Now speaking of salmon populations, in some species of fish like the Chinook uh, salmon, uh, high temperatures increase the metabolic cost of their migration. Okay, Chinook salmon uh, often migrate hundreds of kilometers from their natural riverine areas to the ocean and they will return to their natal areas for spawning. Okay, and salmon prefer relatively cool water and increasing water temperatures will compromise their cardiovascular and metabolic physiology. Okay, so these fishes, they often need to rest and stop uh, to replenish their metabolic substrates during the migration. So they often need to rest in tranquil warm water to do so. But if this warm water continues to increase in temperature, this will create problems for the fish. Because as they rest and replenish their substrates, uh, this leads to, uh, you know, this will prolong their migration time and this will pr prolong their exposure to warm water, which would then compromise their cardiovascular and metabolic physiology. Okay, so in such a state, they are also at greater risk at being preyed on by predators. So, fewer survive the journey. Thankfully, there are some really kind human beings who are trying to do something to help the Chinook salmon. Let's watch this video to find out more. Sorry. Some problems. Here we go. My name is Jim Hellfield, and we're standing on the South Fork of the Nooksack River, where uh, we've just been collecting some instruments that's part of a long term study which is assessing the effectiveness of uh, some habitat restorations, salmon habitat restoration. Uh, I've been working in collaboration with the Nooksack Indian Tribe and they've been building these large engineered log jams, such as that one over there, which you see over there. And those are designed to help uh, alter the river's flow to create deep, complex pools that should provide good habitat for salmon. But for the past few years, we've been out here measuring water temperature, bed topography, uh, fish use. And we've also been measuring hyperic exchange because we're curious to see if when these log jams are built when the pools go in, if that'll encourage more shallow groundwater upwell into the river, which might help keep things cool. Uh, so we just spent today walking up and down the river to various plots, pulling some of my temperature loggers that I've had out there, which have been measuring water temperatures, and taking pictures of some of the log jams. About half of the log jams have already been built, the other half will be built starting next year, and then we'll be able to see how those log jams have, have changed habitat. So the main focus of this work is for what we call the early Chinook. These are the spring and summer run Chinook salmon. They enter this river uh, in the summertime, and they have to spend pretty much the hottest time of the year in the river before they get a chance to spawn in the fall. In this river, uh, the South Fork here, unlike the North and Middle Forks, uh, which drain glaciers, the South Fork just drains snowfields off the systems. And so it has a tendency to get very warm in the summertime. And so uh, a big focus of our work is trying to create pockets of cool water refuge for those early Chinook salmon. And so far what we're seeing is that uh, 
the overwhelming majority of the early Chinook that we're seeing in this river here are making use of those log jams. They're hunkered down in the bottom, in the low, cool parts of the river under the logs. When temperatures get to be above 16 degrees Celsius, uh, it's really hard on the salmon and their mortality rates increase drastically. So if we can provide these little pockets of cool water here and there where the fish can hold for a little while, cool off and then make their way further upstream, we think that that'll improve their chances of, of successfully reaching the spawning grounds. At the same time, the baby salmon, the young juveniles, after they emerge from the gravel, those log jams provide those same pools, provide excellent refuge habitat for them, where they can get out of the main current, they can get down and hide among all the, the, lo the root wads and branches, and they can get away from their predators, and they can also cool off. And, and there's you know, more oxygen saturated down there, and so it's just better habitat for virtually all life stages. This project, I should say, is run largely with undergraduate field technicians. So we bring the students out here, they help me to collect the data, uh, we take it back to the lab, they analyze the data. Having all of this stuff so close to the university, it's like we've got, we've got the outdoors as our lab. It's right here. The other thing that I think is you know, special about this project is uh, it's been a really nice collaboration between the university and the, and the Nooksack tribe. It's been a nice thing for our students to be able to get involved and get to meet professionals who work there. And salmon are an iconic cultural, economic, social, religious icon here. Uh, they, 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 play, they play such an important role in the culture of the Northwest. And there are a lot of us here who have pretty much dedicated our careers to trying to preserve them and, and maintain them in harvestable sizes. Um, sometimes it feels like we're fighting a losing battle, uh, but sometimes there's reason for hope. Um, like on a day like today where we can see some of these log jams that we've built and we can see some of those huge salmon that are that are hiding down and making use of them. So um, yeah, I, I think it's I think there's reason to be optimistic. That was cool, right? It's great to have a school uh, so near such beautiful outdoors like that. And you can have um, all your experimental projects uh, outdoors. And um, meaningful conservation projects as well. Okay, now let's move on to talk about the impact of global warming on insect migration. Now just like for plants and animals, climate change has an impact on the phenology and migration patterns for insects too. Okay, so due to these re regional and global temperature changes, some insects are also migrating progressively earlier or increasing the duration of their migration. Okay, this is likely because climate change has impacted um, their host plants and their habitats. So the avail availability and distribution of their host plants and hab habitats for these insects may have been affected by climate change and so this forces the insects to migrate or change their migration patterns. Okay, An example will be uh, that of the aphid, aphids in the UK. So data has been collected over the past 50 years that showed that over 55 species of aphids started flying progressively earlier in the year and most species showed increasing duration of their flying season. Now, so the changes in insect migration patterns may alter the, the, their lifetime fitness of the individuals in addition to biodiversity and ecosystem processes, both at regional and global scales. Alright, what do I mean? Now, extreme weathers can depress, flight and kill the migrating insects. Okay, migrating insects also, once they have reached a new destination, they will have to move around more to look for their sources of food. Okay, so they may be burn through their stored winter fats and this will result in an energy shortage for their next migration. So this is why I said that changes in insect migrations may alter their lifetime fitness. Uh, yes. The increased distribution of migrating uh, insects also will surely disrupt ecosystems as they move into new areas, they compete with other species, they, they uh, create competition with other species, they, um, you know, they will affect other host plants and all that. So they will definitely disrupt ecosystems. 
And due to climate change, some insect species actually have reduced their migratory behaviour and become uh, more sedentary populations. Okay, just hold on. I want to change my pointer option. Okay, so and actually uh, for this impact, there's actually a slight positive benefit. It has been discovered that uh, species that have become more sedentary uh, have actually... Um, uh, the the they have altered the incidence of their the infections. All right. So actually, uh, sorry, uh, I correct myself. Actually, the migration okay has helped to reduce the incidence of disease among the insects. Okay. So uh, what I meant is that uh, with in changing migration patterns for species that uh, have continued to uh, migrate, it actually helps to reduce the incidence of disease among uh, the insects. Okay, this is because individuals usually leave the contaminated habitats when they migrate, right? And infected individuals are separated from others during migration as well. Okay, and the infected in individuals are more likely to succumb to the disease okay, during the demanding long distance movement during migration. So migration helps to reduce the incidence of disease among the insects. Okay, and how do we know this? Because when we look at the case of monarch butterflies in the US, they are the ones that have uh, drastically changed their migratory behavior in recent years due to habitat alterations and some of them have become uh, sedentary and non-migratory okay and uh, the incidence of sedentary and non-migratory populations has actually been increasing and it is found that the non-migratory populations have a significantly greater rate of infection by the protozoan okay so compared to migratory populations so in and of course, infected butterflies have significantly reduced lifespans. So this is an example whereby um, migration have certain uh, benefits to migratory uh, insects. And the problem is when there is climate change and um, the re the behavior, the migratory behavior of these insects, the normal migratory behavior of these insects are reduced and they start to become sedentary, it actually can increase the incidence of disease among these sedentary populations. Okay, so in this way, this is like the opposite effect, right? So in this way, climate change causing certain uh, normally migratory insects to become more sedentary can actually increase the incidence of disease among them and so that is how that is a negative impact of climate change. Okay, so let's take a look at this video to uh, further understand the issue with uh, the migratory patterns of monarch butterflies. and things like that. But let's for once talk about something very small, and that is the monarch butterfly. Now, if you are in California, as we are here, you might have noticed something a little bit weird about the monarch butterflies, and that is that there aren't any. And it's odd because at one point, there was a lot actually. In the 1980s, between 10 million and 4.5 million monarchs spent their winter in California every single year. The last count conducted annually by volunteers each November showed that in 2018, there may be as few as 30,000 across the state, a number that's 87% lower than just the year before. And overall, we've lost 97% of the monarch butterflies in just a couple of decades. And it's the sort of thing that if you were not some sort of butterfly aficionado, you might not have noticed because it's hard for humans to notice things when they're not there. But that is absolutely massive. A huge change over the course of less than one lifetime, just a couple of decades, we've lost almost every single one of this species that we just took for granted for a long time. And uh, that is not some accident. There's a couple of different ways that, uh, that people in America have caused that. Uh, and let's break them down. But, but first, a volunteer guide who works in the areas where they count uh, these butterflies, uh, Anthony Gutierrez says, it's a sad reality of climate change. For every little thing that changes, there's not just one consequence, it's a whole chain reaction. 
And that is the thing about biology is that you can't, it's like when making manipulations to human genes, you can't get one little change. A lot of little things change as well and sometimes cascade into massive things. Um, but here's the situation with the butterflies. For years, Western monarchs have faced habitat loss in both the places they breed and where they spend their winters, increased use of pesticides, and as well deadly stressors like severe weather and drought. And that is a problem in a lot of different places in America, but especially in California where we've had years and years of drought ever worsening. It's one of the reasons that we have the forest fires that we do recently. And that is not just a problem for trees and the setting on fire of those trees. It's a problem for the, the, the animals that live out there in the wilderness. Okay, so if the drought kills something that the butterflies need to survive, then that might take a little bit for us to actually notice. And it might be a while before so many are dead that it turns up in these yearly reviews that they do, but it is absolutely massive. And here's the thing, <clears throat> scientifically, when it comes to climate change, I've done a lot of reading, but I am far from a butterfly expert. I can't tell you at this point what long-term effect there will be for other animals or for nature if we lose all of our butterflies. But I have to imagine that it's probably not a good thing. And when you put it in the context of the other animals and insects that we've lost recently, I certainly think that there is reason to worry. This is something that we talked about earlier this year, but researchers in Germany found flying insect populations there had decreased by up to 82% over the last three decades. A collection of separate studies showed that the populations of most of the insect species included had been nearly cut in half. And you might recall, if you've been watching the show for a while, something like six weeks ago, we talked about a study of worldwide animal populations. So not just the insects, but the bigger animals as well. And in many parts of the world, their numbers had been cut down by 40, 50, 60, or even more percent. So what ends up happening? If we lose the butterflies, okay, is it just sad because we don't get to take pictures of them? Or you know, you don't get to walk around in a, in a, in a dewy field and think, my, isn't nature beautiful? No, it probably has consequences. We certainly know with the bees that it does. We've lost almost all of our bees in America because of our widespread use of pesticides. That is gonna make it difficult for other plants to pollinate and spread. It has an impact, obviously, on farming. All of these things add up. And at the end of the day, can we really say that the path that we're treading right now when it comes to our environment, when it comes to our approach to animals and plants, that it's sustainable, that this is not gonna have a long-term effect, not on the little things like the butterflies, but on us as well? I can't tell you that. And when I see something like this, when I see a story that we've lost all these monarch butterflies, I think this is the exact sort of story that nobody is gonna care about. It's gonna seem so small, so petty, so specific. It's California, it's monarch butterflies. But it's not just that, it's the context that they live in. And that context is an environment that is becoming inhospitable to more and more species on a yearly basis. All right, so according to that video, uh, you, the, the monarch butterflies used to uh, migrate to California during winter time. Okay, that's where they will breed also. Okay, and but then uh, California has been experiencing a lot of climate change and uh, increase in droughts and forest fires. So that those uh, uh, probably killed off or destroyed the habitats for these butterflies. So they no longer migrate to California. So they become more sedentary and as a result, unfortunately, they succumb to more diseases. All right, so with that, I have completed going through with you LOA, sorry, and L, uh, sorry, LOB for this particular lecture in and in my previous lectures uh, on LOA. Okay, so the emphasis of these two LOs is that you have to identify and explain human activities that have contributed to increased emissions of greenhouse gases. Okay, just focus on carbon dioxide and methane. Okay, and there are three particular human activities that leads to the increased emissions of these greenhouse gases. Namely, first, number one, the burning of fossil fuels, right? Number two, deforestation, and number three, food choices. Remember, go meat free. Okay, and for LOB, the focus is to uh, study the effects of climate change as a result of those increased greenhouse gas emissions mainly on our environment, okay, such as the melting of our polar ice caps, rising sea levels, stress on, stress on fresh water supplies, 
uh, increasing intensity and durations of heat waves and uh, heavy rains, or in other words, increase in uh, extreme weather events, okay, as well as the effect on living organisms such as coral reefs, migration of fishes and insects, okay. All right. So in the next few lectures, um, other lecturers will cover uh, other different LOs. Okay, so I hope you continue to enjoy studying climate change. Talk to you another time.